And once again, thank you all for joining us tonight for the Los Angeles Birders webinar. Los Angeles Birders or LA Birders is an all volunteer organization. Uh, your membership dues and donations uh, to us help, uh, help to uh, fund things like this uh, webinar, help fund it being recorded and placed on the web so that everyone can enjoy it down the, down the pike. Oh, I went to Pike Place, by the way. Did I tell you? Oh, never mind. Um, it also helps support our community science projects, our student burgers, and lots of wonderful, wonderful things. And with that, I think we're going to move to our webinar. Calvin, if you can do the honors, please. Thank you, Ron. I'm uh, very excited to introduce Dr. Brian Linkhart. Uh, our speaker tonight, Dr. Brian Linkhart, has been a professor in the Department of Organismal Biology and Ecology at Colorado College since 2001, where he teaches field courses in ornithology, ecology, and field biology. Previously, he was a seasonal research biologist for the Rocky Mountain Research Station for 18 years, and he began teaching summer field seminars on forest ecology in the mid-1980s. Over the past 40 years, Brian has conducted research on the ecology of songbirds, grouse, hawks, and owls across the American Southwest and Mexico. But since 2001, summers have mostly been spent uh, mentoring six to 10 undergraduate students while conducting field research on flammulated owls. Please welcome Dr. Brian Linkhart. All right. Thank you, Calvin. I appreciate that. And uh, thanks to the Los Angeles Birders for hosting me. I'm happy to be here tonight and happy to be talking with all of you and happy to be talking about one of my favorite subjects, <laughs> lamulated owls. And as Calvin indicated, um, yeah, I've been doing this a long time. And um, I'm going to be sharing with you tonight uh, some aspects that, that my students and I have learned about the migration of lamulated owls. Surprise, surprise in the title. But um, I'm going to switch to the first slide because I so that I can start um, underway with that as I narrate a little bit more here as well. And uh, I will take the screen here. And we're at the first screen view. Excellent. I okay. think so. You have to go into pre oh, there you go. Perfect. Everything pull up okay? It looks great. Thanks. Okay. So, yeah, what I want to talk about tonight is one of the aspects that students and I have been working with over the next last dozen years or so. So, um, on the migration of flammulated owls. But what I also want to share with you is that this owl that's been the focus now of work for 40 years, I mean, you might wonder what, what else can you? learn about any particular animal over 40 years, right? Um, but this is uh, quite an example of a long-term work that has had, man, many parts to it that, that continue to blossom over time. And, and I continue to be excited about the, the research and sharing about the research as well. Um, and uh, so a few things I'll, I'll share about the owl as I get into talking about some of the components of the study. As uh, perhaps um, at least some of you know, this is one of the smallest owls in North America. Only the elf owl is smaller. So among the 19 species, this is, you know, next to the smallest. And of the almost 200 species of owls worldwide, they really don't get any smaller than this either. So small enough to fit in the palm of your hand, as you'll see in some slides coming up. Uh, flammulated, for those of you that didn't have time to look it up. <laughs> It's Latin uh, derivative is, uh, um, is flamula, which means small flame. And it's so named because of the streaks of, of reddish orange plumage that you know, might, might, uh, might uh, uh, have the uh, illusion of, of small flames on the spatial, especially around the facial disc, but on the scapulars of the, of the back and some other parts of the plumage as well. But um, this is a remarkable coloration because it sheds a lot of light on the types of habitats that are occupied by this owl. One that uh, is principally dominated by, 
by dry pine species, not the least of which, the most important of which is, is ponderosa pine. Uh, Jeffrey pine that's in California is, is a pretty close related, related species. But as I'll show you and talk to you, as these ponderosa pine trunks get older and older, they get more orange and more orange. And, and it's the old forest to which these owls are, are most uh, camouflaged and most adapted for their existence. Um, totally nocturnal. And in a few minutes, I'll, I'll probably mimic a few calls. Some of you can join, join in from the comfort of your home if you wish to try to uh, see if you can mimic some of these calls as well. <clears throat> but uh, this has been um, a, a labor of a lot of fun and enjoyment over the years. Since 2001, as Calvin indicated, I've been at uh, Colorado College. Um, and this is where I've had by far the, the greatest extent of field help that I've had in the duration of the study. Um, and I think as Calvin also indicated, uh, there have been many years in which I've had upwards of 10 students that have, been, that have worked with me uh, for the duration of their summer as we've worked intensively on the breeding ecology of these owls as several of these, these pictures will, will demonstrate for sure. Um, and um, along with that, these students, uh, some of which have done undergraduate theses, several of which have gone on to graduate school, you know, after graduating from Colorado College as well, um, that have been wonderful to continue to, uh, to uh, enjoy as, as colleagues in the field and so forth. Well, um, from the beginning of the study, you know, in the early 1980s, and by the way, I wasn't much older than, than Calvin when I first started working with Flyman Later Dolls. I was an undergraduate, actually, at, at Colorado State University. But um, it was at that time that I had an opportunity to do some bird research, and I wasn't really, I was into a lot of natural things when I was a, um, a young a kid, <laughs> I will call myself. But I didn't really have a focus on birds at all at that time. I thought they were pretty cool, but a lot of things were pretty cool. But when I got turned on to owls and I discovered that this was an owl species that almost nothing was known about, that became very intriguing for me to, to be involved in, in some work to learn more. And some aspects of that that were known early on was that, well, at least some of the nests that had been found in Colorado had been found in, in ponderosa pine forests and and in quaking aspen that were found in these pine forests, but not much was known about their, their habitat associations. It was known that they were secondary cavity nesters. At least that's the only place that these nests had been found. Uh, for those of you that uh, 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 don't know this, uh, um, they have to nest in, in cavities that are excavated by, by sometimes natural cavities, but almost always by uh, natural um, excavators, uh, uh, woodpeckers. And in this part of the country, that primarily means northern flickers, but sometimes sap suckers as well. Uh, if these owls cannot find an abandoned cavity like like this, then you know they they would go extinct because they don't know how to to make such a nest on their own. Um, the third aspect that I have on the screen, um, it would have long been known or wondered, I might say, that these birds were migratory, but but nobody knew, and. Um, Part of what I'll be talking to you about tonight is filling in some gaps that had never been discovered before, never never had any data to shed any light on. Uh, it knew, it, people knew that the owls were insectivorous. Uh, we've since discovered that they feed especially on small moths uh, of the family Noctuity, about the size of the moths that, that fly around porch lights on summer nights and so forth, different species many times. Um, it had been known that in the fall, um, some of some flammulated owls would, had turned up in places like uh, off the Gulf Coast, off the coast of, of uh, Louisiana, um, on oil platforms and, and other, uh, which indicated that, you know, this, this is what happens with long distance migrants. So perhaps the flam is, is one of these as well. But nothing was known about, you know, the particular destinations that, that they might go to um, with to any extent at all. Um, at the bottom, in, in the slide here, I wanted to impress upon you the association of flammulated owls and, and ponderosa pine. On the left, you see the figure of the distribution of, 
of ponderosa pine across the western United States, which which has the widest distribution of any pine species. And um, you can see it extending up into northern BC and, and down into Mexico. Well, on the right, you see the distribution of flammulated owls, or at least um, that which we, we know they uh, where they happen to be found, or at least have been reported. And man, if you look at those two figures, they can pretty much be transposed on top of each other. And that gives some, uh, some idea, some, some, uh, some verification to the extent to which these, these owls and their distribution really coincide with the distribution of ponderosa pine. Well, over the years, I have expected, based on this close association, that um, if we ever did learn where these owls migrate to and substantiate the fact that they are long distance migrants, um, it probably would not be too surprising that we might find them associated with pine forests that extend uh, down through Mexico and so forth. And, and that's something I'll speak to here in a few minutes as well. Um, and uh, owing to these characteristics and also some aspects that I'm gonna share with you in the next slide, this owl has had um, several designations that have been listed um, by the government and private entities that have indicated that this owl is probably one to keep an eye on. Um, it's identified as sensitive species by the U.S. Forest Service, a species of special concern by the Fish and Wildlife Service, and, and by uh, um, related agencies in the Canadian government as well. So these were added incentive to for me and, and some other individuals to, to try to learn more about the, the ecology and biology of the, of the species as well. Um, to date, there are actually five study sites in Colorado where students and I have, have studied the owl. And I've listed these on the screen. Um, Hotel Gulch in the upper right is the one that has the data that extends uh, to, the, uh, to the greatest uh, period of time in the past. Um, and the other one's more recent, but um, all of these have been central to learning more about the biology and ecology of the owl um, and have contributed to what we've been learning from, from about the migration of these owls as well. Okay. Um, well, um, let me give you as part of the backdrop here before I dive into the migration data, a sense for what an average summer looks like for the by the flam crew <laughs> and yours truly that, that's led the crew. Um, and um, this is probably a good place for me to indicate that um, a large part of the focus of this work has been um, trying to better understand some, some basic demographic uh, characteristics of the population, especially trying to key in on the reproduction patterns of reproduction and survival. So basic demography um, of the population and populations. And on top of that, um, I've employed sort of a, a, a longitudinal approach to studying these owls. That is to say, the goal has been to study the reproduction and survival of individuals over their entire lifetimes, um, not knowing in the beginning what a lifetime might indicate, might, might be for a flammulated owl. <clears throat> but um, that, uh, that focus has meant that um, this, this has been a mark recapture study. Uh, we try to capture every single owl on the five study sites, which is truly a time consuming thing in a, in a summer for me and the small army of students. And for every owl that we capture, then we will place a leg band on them so that we can track them over their, their entire lifetimes. This is adults as, as well as owlets. Um, uh, we, we, you know, that's the goal. We don't end up capturing every single bird, but that is totally the goal. And we come pretty close to it in, in, in all years of the study. Well, when they come back from migration, um, that is to say, when the academic year is over and as soon as I can turn around uh, my efforts to, to get in the field with students, um, students and I will, will begin our work in the early part of the summer by trying to determine where on each study site the owls are going to be settling and where the males are going to be establishing their territories. Um, you see in the upper diagram and the right, uh, polygons, these blue polygons with individual numbers like A4 or A8, these are the, the, the names, so to speak, of particular males that have settled into these areas. But each year we need to canvas each of the study areas to A, um, number, uh, to, to determine whether 
particular um, males from the previous year have returned or not, and whether they have reoccupied the same territory or not. Um, and after we've established residence by males, and we go after females. Anyway, this involves territory mapping, which uh, essentially using playback or imitating their call, um, we get the males to respond to us with their quiet hoots, and we follow them around. Yes, we chase them around at night <laughs> with uh, two-way radios in hand <clears throat> and headlamps um, up and down the steep mountains in which they're found of these ponderosa pine forests to determine where these owls are and where their territory boundaries are. Well, this is the participation part. I'm, I'm going to mimic a flammulated owl call to, I mean, you probably, perhaps, at least some of you have, have heard uh, recorded calls of them. <clears throat> But here's a quick demonstration on how to imitate the, the call yourself, okay? Um, and I, I'm convinced that anyone can do this. It's just a matter of taking some time to learn it and do it yourself. <laughs> um, and if one devotes uh, a few weeks to the process of learning this, um, I, th I think you can get pretty good at doing it. And the real test is seeing if you're out in the field, if you can get a flammulated owl to um, respond to you. And if you can, man, uh, you're you're on your way. So the call sounds something like this. This is this is a male uh, territorial call that sounds like. So it's about that cadence. It's about that pitch. Although there is some variance with it, um, and I don't know how well my microphone may have picked that up, but it should sound sort of hollow to you. And so the key to, you, you know, working our larynx to make it sound like a bird's syrinx is a little bit of a tricky one. But if you open your throat up a little wider and you, you try to have the air that's going through your throat, um, instead of having it go straight through your teeth, if you try to bounce that air up off the top of your, of your mouth so that it's, there's a transformation that goes from something sounding like like a human would do to now I can't hear you, but I hope you're jumping in. You get to everybody on the count of three, you can jump in and try to make that hollow sound. Go one, two, three. Okay, now here's the second part. If you are a really PO'd male, that is to say, you're really agitated at the resident male next to you, territory adjacent to you in, in the study area, then the call changes. And to express that, it becomes a three note call, which sounds like. It's about that loud. And when we hear that, that the three note call at night, man, we stop everything and we start really running. Uh, through the forest. I mean, you know, if we were running fast before, then it's we put the burners on because if we get to the owl before he stops, that's almost guaranteed of of telling us where uh, one of the trees along the territory boundary is because it's it's really informative. Uh, when males do that, they usually are having a territorial battle, a territory encounter, as we say, and we can learn the most from from that effort. <laughs> okay, keep practicing. Okay, <laughs> there'll be a quiz at the end. Um, so once we, this, so this is a nighttime effort, obviously. Um, once we know the boundaries of a territory, then we systematically begin searching for a nest within the boundaries or as close as we can determine at that time, the boundaries of a territory. And we mark every single tree with cavities in our study sites. That can mean anywhere from, oh, 50 to sometimes over 200 uh, trees with cavities in, in one particular territory, let alone study area, usually over well over a thousand in a particular study area. Um, we mark these permanently. Uh, we put metal tags on them. We, we take the, their GPS location so that we can make maps and, and geographic information system uh, software and so forth, so that we can systematically go through our databases to look for these owl nests and try never to uh, miss a nest that might be in a study area. Um, once we find the nests, then that becomes our ticket for being able to capture the owls and learn, um, you know, who the the identity of these owls. I won't go into detail about capturing, but this can be a, a very time-consuming process. 
Um, it certainly was in the beginning try to, to figure out how uh, to capture an owl that might be nesting 30, 40, 50, 60 feet off the ground. Um, but succinctly, the, the best approach, the most successful approach, is using a, a collapsible fiberglass pole that extends up to about 50 feet and collapses down to uh, six foot sections that we can extend and put um, essentially a, a, a butterfly net on the end, what looks like a butterfly net or a sweep net that's woven out of mist net material that uh, many of you are familiar with for, for uh, you know, setting up mist nets for capturing birds. This is what I use my old mist nets for is, is creating these bags. And you raise it up to the cavity um, and uh, um, well, there's much more to it, but basically you wait until the male flies in with prey. And once he's in the cavity, you raise this up as fast as you can in the, in the pitch darkness uh, to try to get over the cavity before he, before he leaves the cavity to go get uh, more food. Um, this is the, one of the most important methods for capturing males, although it does require a lot of patience. We also use mist nets as well. But in this manner, we capture the adults and the young and this is the means by which I'll just start describing here in a few minutes um, how we captured the owls to put on, on devices for tracking their migration movements as well. Um, okay, so one last piece of backdrop I wanted to share with you about the owls. Um, none, none of this was, was, of course, known before the study began. And by the way, this remains the only intensive work um, and certainly long-term work on the owl and in, in, in across the range. Um, that has looked at and tracked owls over their entire life, lifetimes for sure. Um, the owl has a, we, we've discovered over time that the owl has a, a very low reproductive rate on the order of about two and a half eggs or two and a half owlets per nest, per brood. Um, the eggs look like uh, miniature ping pong balls, as you can see in one of the pictures there. Uh, the owls, um, the males, I should say, often show delayed breeding. They can be upwards of seven years old before they may breed for the first time. Usually they're in their third year, second to third year before they breed, but sometimes as, as many as, as uh, double that. A uh, very high survival rate. Males and females uh, tend to have higher, very high survival rates on the order of 80% plus per year. Um, males, uh, it appears, um, have higher survival rates than females. And the lifespan of males is upwards of, of 14, uh, 14 to 20 years as well. And I'd say probably the average is about uh, 10 to 12, but um, very long lived birds. And for those of you that know much about owls or, or uh, birds in general, you know, this is something that's really similar to larger raptors, much larger raptors. Um, and because of this, I like to say that that uh, flams look like they're, you know, a, 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 a large bird trapped in the body of a, of a small bird because they greatly um, resemble in these life history characteristics what, what larger birds are, are like. And the smaller birds that, you know, um, on the order of songbirds and so forth are the ones that typically um, have the much shorter lifespans and, and so forth. But um, this owl sort of bucks that trend. Um, these things are important in, in many regards, certainly in, from a conservation standpoint as well. Um, any owl that has a low reproductive rate, um, any bird that has a low reproductive rate, for conservation reasons, that means that we, you know, any any time populations uh, decline or um, uh, go into a, uh, a, a decline that 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 means that you know populations may be winking out or getting close to it. Um, you're more concerned about populations that have these kinds of characteristics because that means they're inherently low to recover um, once they reach those kinds of, of conditions. So for a bird like this and, and many others, you know, uh, trying to better understand their habitat relationships and the minimum areas for populations to be able to successfully breed are very important things. Well, it is these techniques that um, for capturing the owls and and carrying on this long-term demography um, morphed into one of the objectives that, that has, has been a focus now for about the last decade, I think I mentioned, um, as well as many others. This is a multifaceted study of which this has been just one part. But for the remainder of the time here, what I'll share with you are some aspects that we've learned now over the last dozen years or so 
especially with respect to these, these four key attributes. Um, the timing of migration um, and their departure, uh, wintering destinations for sure, where do they go, especially Mexico versus Central America, and uh, what forest types, what habitat associations they have. Um, some aspects about their stopover locations, because these can be critical things from a conservation standpoint as well, and the routes by which they, they move from one stopover location to another. Um, there's a concept referred to as migratory connectivity, which is basically the idea of trying to determine um, how specific are, uh, is a population that has a particular breeding site, you know, for example, in, in the states of, of, of the US, and where they go to winter. Are they the only population that happen to winter in a particular area that's, that's from also a, their own particular area where they breed, or is there overlap? Um, we tend to say that a bird has strong migratory connectivity if they have this ex exclusiveness going on where they may be the only population that may be experiencing habitats on either end of, of that migration. And that's important from a conservation standpoint too, because then these populations are potentially more vulnerable to local extinctions and um, you know, becoming a, a, a danger to the overall stability of the entire species and the multiple populations that, 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 uh, com you know, that compose it. So part of my goal has been to learn more about the connectivity aspects of flammulated owls as well. Um, well, these four aspects uh, became a, a, a focus, a possible focus, starting in a, around um, 2010, 2009 in particular. And that's when the technology started becoming um, good enough and packages of electronics could become small enough that it became, started to become feasible for small birds to be the focus of migration work. And this is where not only birds like flammulator owls, but small songbirds really started taking advantage of these things as well. It wasn't, it wasn't just me, but man, I'd been thinking about this forever. So I thought, wow, this, this might be finally be possible for us to learn for the first time where particular owls migrate to and what their, you know, their whole process might look like that I'd mentioned on the previous slide about that migration. So starting in 2009, I started using what are referred to as light level loggers. Um, some of you may also know these as geolocators. And on the left part of the screen, you can see some of these. Um, I um, can put my cursor on a, on a stock of a geolocator, um, the left center of the screen. And essentially these devices, which you see in the screen here, here are geolocators that my, my uh, um, pointer is on. Um, I'll talk about GPS loggers on, on the upper part here by the dime here in just a moment, but they're all basically dime size or smaller devices, and they're attached to the owl via backpack harness that I've that I've uh, worked at um, uh, trying to refine since the 1980s when I started first started putting radio transmitters on owls, um, and today we use a heavy fishing line, which is. Um, really, I'm, I'm not sure I can imagine anything getting better than this. It's a, it's a, uh, a braided nylon fishing uh, string that's about 20 pound um, uh, weight test. And uh, this is extremely light and it has enabled this, this harness that it sits on the, that allows the, the, the device to sit on the back, cross over on the shoulders like the backpack harness that might, you might wear in a day pack, cross um, on the breast and come back under the wings to attach on the, on the back of the unit as well. Um, and uh, so the whole unit um, from the, the logger to the harness uh, weighs, you know, on the order of about a gram, which um, my students would tell me, the, um, you know, a, an Oreo cookie, <laughs> my students tell me, uh, weighs on the order of about uh, Oh man, I guess I've forgotten off the top of my head how much does that weigh? I might have to look it up. Um, 20 grams or something, uh, um, 10 to 20 grams or something like this. So uh, a number of these harnesses and, and, and devices could fit in an Oreo cookie for the, for the weight that an Oreo um, consists of. It's 
my students' favorite snack at three o'clock in the morning anyway. <laughs> um, so very small. And of course, they need to stay this small because uh, the owls themselves are very small. There's a goal among biologists to keep the weight of devices at less than 3% of the mass of the bird that they're targeting. Flammulated owls, by the way, weigh the males on the order of about 50 grams. Um, so these light level devices have started using in, in 2009. Um, the recovery rate has been um, challenging. And um, I'll talk about that more a bit more in a moment. Um, the GPS loggers didn't arrive on the scene until 2016. So it's only been about the last six-ish years that I've been able to put these devices on owls. Uh, these devices in combo really work well together. The light, the light level um, loggers, the geolocator, geolocators, they have um, some advantages and disadvantages. Disadvantages, they're, they're not very accurate, at least um, on a small scale plus or minus 100 kilometers, or in the order of about um, 60 miles. Um, so, you know, locally, that's not very accurate, but when a bird is, is moving, you know, across continents, or largely so, then, of course, it's still extremely beneficial. The GPS loggers, um, by the way, one of the other advantages of, of the light-level loggers is that um, for the battery that is inside the unit, it can gather data for um, 300 or 400 days, uh, consecutive days before the battery burns out, which is really good because that make, means, you know, a year or more. Um, the, G, the GPS loggers have opposite advantages and disadvantages. Because they're communicating with satellites, they burn through power. Um, and so you can only get about 30 or 40 days of locations that can be stored on this device that can be powered um, by the battery that's within them, but they're exceedingly accurate. I mean, plus or minus 10 meters. Um, that, you know, it doesn't get much better than that in the field, or at least at, at this kind of scale for learning about migration. Um, the, a, a disadvantage of both of these, because they are so small, the logger has to be physically recovered before you can download the data. <laughs> so this means you have to recapture the owl, uh, the, the owl you know, a year later, hopefully, if you're going to have a chance of getting at the data that the bird experienced <laughs> and uh, the locations of which were, were stored on the unit that you hope to get your hands on. And hence the recovery rate on both of these has been, if we're lucky to hit about 50%, then, then we're pretty lucky in that regard. Anyway, what I'd like to share with you are some of the initial findings and where we are today with this. This is one of the first geolocators I wanted to show you the data associated with it here. And um, you can see for this geolocator, we can see its route. Um, so the, the, the line, the squiggly line in, in um, sort of the gold is the southbound uh, route, the, the fall migration, and the green was in the spring, okay? So we can see in the gold um, font as well that the, this owl left Colorado on its migration on 21st of October, made its way south. Um, it, uh, it arrived on the wintering grounds, which turned out to be uh, the, the southern state of Michoacan in Mexico um, in early November, um, and stayed there probably until early April. There were some problems with uh, uh, some of the accuracy of the data in that period of time, so I don't have the exact date. Um, those are some aspects I can address and questions at the end if you'd like. But this yielded information that's shown in, um, a, in, in a series of polygons here where the, the green innermost um, portion of the polygon is the 75% uh, polygon showing where about 75% of the, of the owl's uh, wintertime movements were contained within that polygon. and um, the the outermost one, the golden, contains 100% of them. Um, but um, uh, so those are estimates of, of the locations of this owl based on the, uh, the, the kernel density um, polygons that were generated by this. But um, this being one of the first owls we, we learned this on, it was, uh, you know, despite however the polygons may look, this was 
an exceedingly uh, great glimpse into the destination and the route of, of this particular owl and its locations on the particular days uh, to and fro in its, on its migration route. Well, over time, um, and by the way, um, I wanted to let's see, did I put that on here? Um, over time, we have recovered now um, 12 geolocators, and you can see these, the, the uh, centroids are demarked by these, um, these, these red, dot, red dots on the screen. And um, you can see most of them are spread across, across southern Mexico, various states of Michoacan, um, Guerrero, um, and a couple of areas um, around uh, the uh, uh, Veracruz as well. Two uh, geolocators um, and, and the males that carried them spent the winter in Tamaulipas, one of the more northern states. And those two, those two actually remain the farthest, um, the shortest migrants, I should say, according to the recoveries that we've had to the current day. Most of them, as you'll see here in just a moment, have, have been in southern Mexico. Um, so this is a distance that is, you know, these more distant sites uh, on the order of 2,500 to 3,000 kilometers. And it's typically required um, about uh, two weeks, sometimes more, to be able to get to these particular destinations in the fall. Well, the GPS loggers, the more accurate one, are depicted in this, in this screen here. And to date, um, I show eight of them on the screen here, including the most distant one that you can see down in the bottom right. This is an owl that migrated um, uh, and spent the winter in Guatemala. And um, uh, this actually just happened a couple of years ago. I'm, I'm anticipating more owls as this, as this work goes on, more owls ending up and showing their wintering destinations in Central America. But that is the only one at the, of the small sample size at the moment. But most of them um, on the GPS loggers showing their specific locations in the southern states, again, of uh, uh, Guerrero, Michoacan, um, and uh, 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 also the southern state of, of uh, 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 Chiapas and uh, uh, ooh, a couple of states right around there uh, as well. Um, you can see the routes associated with these particular birds. Um, a lot of small dots in there that are coinciding with the stopover locations. What I want to do with the next slide is sort of summarize the the, some of the stopover sites associated with these because these have have shed some light on some interesting aspects associated with the phonology and also sort of the, the, the spatial scale at which they've been associated with these particular movements. And he yeah, put a bullseye on that uh, a Guatemala bird to um, indicate that that's, that's one we're especially interested in learning more about in, in, up in you know, subsequent years here. So if you look collectively at these winter destinations um, of the GPS loggers, as well as the geolocators, um, what I was mentioning a moment ago is, is a little bit more apparent here now, where you can see, if you can see my curse here, the bulk of the individuals that we've had return now um, have been in the Southern portion of Mexico um, in these states just mentioned, um, uh, uh, certainly, especially associated in the states of uh, Guerrero and Michoacan and some further south than that. Well, it's not surprising that these are associated with some really interesting mountain ranges that I'll we'll talk about here in just a moment ago or so as well. And these are the uh, distances that are upwards of about 3,000 3, kilometers or so. Um, let's see, this trans-Mexican volcanic belt um, is an area that I'm going to shed a little bit more light on. You might recall, I'll show you a few more slides of Colorado habitat here in just a few minutes here, but I wanted to highlight uh, both the location and some aspects associated with the geology and, and the, the forest cover that's on these particular sites. Forest cover first. Ponderosa pine is not found this far south, but um, I found it very interesting that these owls are selecting pine species that essentially have very similar structure, the way that they, 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 they're architectured with the large crowns and a lot of surface area. I've seen in Colorado with radio tagged owls that these are exactly the kinds of trees 
that they love to forage in. They spend a lot of time in these open tree crowns of conifers in Colorado during the breeding season, flying into these open tree crowns, um, perching momentarily to find moths that are resting inside on the, on the needle foliage, and then making short flights in the tree crown to glean these insects um, off the foliage. And just based on the habitat of, of what you see in these particular slides, it strongly suggests that these owls may be doing the very same thing uh, to get their food in the wintertime on these particular destinations as well. Well, this Trans-Mexican Volcanic Belt um, is historically an area, as it mentions, of, of strong, strong volcanic activity on the order of, of uh, you know, 40 to 60 uh, plus million years or so ago. But this is an elevated area, volcanic soils for sure, um, well-drained, very dry xeric habitats that are elevated on the order of, um, at least in feet, on the order of about uh, four to 6,000 feet. And uh, um, uh, these habitats are dominated by pine, have a lot of, of uh, live oak species that are in, that are in the understory of, of these as well. And this habitat appears to, especially from the concentration of wintering areas, looks as though it's a, it's a very important um, destination for them. Well, on two different trips, I wanted to call attention. Some of you may maybe have some uh, have in your travels have been down to the really cool uh, monarch preserves in Michoacan, uh, one of which is the Sierra Chinqua. And one of my first trips down there to look for migratory flammulated owls, I spent some time in the area of these monarch preserves looking for flams because I had received notice from one of the monarch uh, researchers that they had accidentally caught a flammulated owl in one of their mist nets. This was back in 2009, actually, right at the beginning of when I was hoping to put geolocators on. So I hadn't even captured any, I uh, hadn't even received any migration information back from the owls, but I went down there uh, trying to do a, a, a trip to learn if I could find flammulated owls down there based on um, this, this, uh, this researcher's tips. And I didn't find, we didn't, my crew and I didn't find, uh, capture any on the Monarch Preserve itself during that trip, but we did start catching owls as soon as we, we got into richer uh, pine mixed with oak forests um, in the surrounding areas to the Monarch Preserve there. Um, well, and so uh, what I wanted to highlight in this slide here is the fact that um, these pine oak forests, you can see all of these slides except the bottom right are from the, from the view of up central Mexico, especially Michoacan, where I've been um, at three trips now. Um, and you can see the pine over story with the oak under story that, where we've captured some owls in there and the Colorado forest in the, in the lower right. Um, very similar in terms of their over story. These, these sites in Mexico are a little more mesic, so they've got more understory than Colorado. But um, I think the same overstory is, is, is uh, accommodating these owls, especially for foraging, but probably some other behaviors as they are in Colorado. Um, what I should also share with you is that with some of the work that we've done in Mexico, uh, the owls that we captured that down there have turned, almost all of them have turned out not to be. Um, migrant flammulated owls, but resident flammulated owls. Owls that uh, presumably breed there during the summer, but are residents in that habitat all year round. And it is only the migrant birds from Colorado and other parts of the West that go down there for the winter time, apparently in areas that are um, either adjoining or perhaps even overlapping where the resident owls are, uh, resident flammulated owls are there. Um, year round. And this is intriguing to me because um, from an, as, an, as an ecologist, I'm really interested in learning more about how it may be possible for flammulated owls of very different populations to occupy the same area, at least for some months at a time, and avoid com uh, competition for limited resources that might be inherent in these areas. I don't have any answers for you on that at the moment, but that's an area that I want to get into in some future research. What I'd like to you to highlight to notice in this slide here, these are all resident birds captured in Mexico, and I want you to notice the degree of redness around the facial disc and on the head and the upper shoulders as well. Man, they've taken the 
the flammulated name <laughs> and they've just put it on steroids with the extent of, of the red orange plumage. They're also smaller owls. On average, they look to be probably even five to 10 grams lighter than Colorado flams, or at least flams that, that summer in Colorado. And um, uh, their, their body measurements tend to be a little bit on the smaller side as well. But facially and based on the plumage, there are some interesting differences there. Um, in the last couple of slides, what I'd like to highlight here um, are some aspects about the stopover habitats. I've already um, mentioned, you know, when I was talking about the volcanic belt, but the question is, between Colorado, at the top of the slide where you see the red star associated with some forests west of Colorado Springs, and the wintering destination, um, what are some patterns associated with where these owls have stopped over as bed, bed and breakfast sites on their fall migration as well as their, their spring migration? And I'll work backwards from the spring uh, uh, from the wintering destination on the spring migration. There have been a number of owls, both, both that have been equipped with geolocators, as well as with the GPS-based devices that have shown that one of the areas um, that, they, that looks like it's favored by a number of individuals is one of the biosphere reserves um, in central Mexico, uh, northern central Mexico, I might say, in the area of the El Cielo uh, Biosphere Reserve. This is a high elevation mountain range on the order of seven to 10,000 feet, sometimes higher. Um, it has xeric forests on the, on the east side, uh, sorry, on the, on the west side, um, uh, and, and a little bit more moist on the east side, closer to the, to the, to the Gulf Coast, but um, still uh, very much the kind of forest that these owls appear to be ad adapted to in Colorado as well. Well, another one of those sites, excuse me, I'm working backwards here, um, is closest, closer to the, the, the Big Bend area of the Rio Grande and the, and the border between Mexico and, and, uh, uh, and the United States. Um, in the forests uh, adjoining the high country, just south of the Big Bend area is another biosphere reserve uh, that's referred to as the Madaris del Carmen. And this area is really rugged country. Uh, I've not been to yet. Um, I'd like to see if I, uh, you know, can, can work the safety aspects to go into there sometime in the <laughs> sometime in the near future to be able to check owls on, on this side of the border because the habitat that they appear to be associated with is, um, is, is definitely pine in the upper regions, very rugged country that seems to be uh, ha have a lot of similarities to what we see further north in the southwestern portion of the United States as well. Um, further north in, in the states, some of you might be familiar with what are referred to as the Sky Islands of southwestern um, U.S. and certainly southeastern Arizona. These are basically uh, island uh, forests, mountain ranges that are isolated in a, in a sea of desert. And by virtue of their elevation gain, they extend high enough elevationally that they, they uh, reach into more mesic, cooler forests that accommodate pine for sure. Ponderosa pine and several live oak species, um, and this this appears to be on the U.S. side a really important area in several sky islands in western Texas and and uh, um, and in southern New Mexico on their way back to Colorado, um, especially on the return trip in the spring. But they also follow this route in the fall to some extent as well, and these mountain ranges um, are apparently offering respites for them to forage and to roost and cover, um, gaining the, uh, the strength and the fat reserves to make it the rest of the way. Well, one more that I want to highlight here is actually in northern New Mexico. And this has been one of the most captivating and, and intriguing stopover sites uh, of as much as any of them. Um, here the owls are stopping over, and I have yet to find an owl that appears to be jumping over and avoiding the stopover in the springtime. Um, rather, it appears that during the time period of, of early April, um, early to mid-April, they are stopping in northern New Mexico at elevations of, of about six to 7,000 feet. These are low elevation ponderosa pine forests, but also pinyon 
um, and, uh, uh, and, and scrub oak, Gamble's oak especially. And they're only probably on the order of about 300 kilometers from the breeding sites in Southern Colorado. And you might ask yourself, well, man, after going 3000 kilometers, what do you need to stop in New Mexico for, especially within that, uh, within that, that short distance um, to be able to prepare for? Um, can't you make it that, <laughs> those last kilometers? And I think it all comes down to um, a staging area that these owls are taking advantage of um, in the weeks leading to uh, returning to Colorado, because many of the springtime, um, many of many of the springtime uh, periods from year to year are, are really have are characterized by unstable weather. Uh, it's not uncommon for there to be late snowstorms, periods of several days in which the temperatures may dive into the teens or low twenties, and and you know. Um, insect and arthropod density just disappears, not only under the cover of snow, but being active in those temperatures as well. And um, I think in order to avoid that collision course, owls are using these staging areas in northern New Mexico as a barometer to, to see when the weather conditions might be more optimal for them to return to Colorado and maybe hang out in New Mexico a bit longer if storms are passing or if there happens to be some fronts that are not as accommodating as they need to be for them to return to their breeding grounds. Um, in any event, um, some last things that I'll share with you, uh, at least some, some habitat aspects that I've looked at um, generally. This is with one of the first papers that I published on the migration of, of lambs that came out in the journal field or in ornithology, um, highlighting at least at a broad spatial scale the importance of the evergreen forest, forest woodland. These are primarily um, you know, broad biome-based designations for pine, oak mixtures, some other habitats in there as well, but this is the primary forest type that these owls appear to be wintering in on their wintering grounds with some other um, types of uh, forests that, that uh, are you know, in the vicinity as well. But I think this is largely driving why they're going to those particular areas to winter. Um, phenology associated with their migration, basically leaving Colorado. Uh, the first individual I showed you several slides back was a bit later than the average. Um, average are leaving Colorado about the end of the first week of October, arriving in, in Mexico on their wintering grounds, some, somewhere around the first or second week of, of November. Um, and then departing Mexico on the order of about the first week of April and arriving back in Colorado in, in early May. So this whole migration spectrum requires about a month of time on either end of the fall versus, versus the, uh, the, the spring migration. Well, in closing, uh, several things that uh, um, I'm continuing to be driven by and trying to learn more about the migration, uh, many of them conservationally driven. These areas um, associated with these winter destinations are definitely areas that, that are threatened by illegal logging and um, aspects such as agricultural conversion. And, you know, one of the reasons I think those bioreserves are very important, not that they're immune to illegal logging, but they do offer some degree of, of protection that, that uh, uh, may, may very well be uh, of increasing importance going forward in the migration of these owls. Uh, it's the stopover habitat that um, has probably uh, is, is of most concern to me, especially in the face of climate change, as you know the distributions of forests um, uh, change over time. That is to say, increase in elevation to try to to um, chase or um, uh, retain the climate considerations that are important for the evolution of of species like, like ponderosa pine, they have no choice but to increase in elevation to find the conditions that are suitable for their growth. And there ha there, there's a lid on this. I mean, there's no, there's a, there's a cap, there's a ceiling on the height uh, of the, the elevation of these sky islands. And so um, these are not very large expanses of habitat anyway. And so I'm concerned about the extent to which these habitats in the future uh, might be be facing some some challenges for these owls to be able to take advantage of. Um, climate change uh, certainly is 
is a driver here, as I was mentioning. Um, I'll share with you also that um, it appears though the, as though the arrival departure dates may not have changed much over time. I mean, I can think back um, in earlier points in time in which, um, you know, I was um, tracking radio tracked owls and finally losing contact with them in the Colorado side in the fall around the, you know, the 12th of October. And um, they're, the, the mean of their leaving Colorado now hasn't changed much. Um, so their arrival departure dates haven't changed that much, I don't think. But um, what, what is changing are definitely the, the dates that the nesting cycle actually does begin, um, especially the hard dates of incubation. And, um, you know, this, this, this uh, bodes as a, as a challenge, I think, going forward to see the, <clears throat> the breeding season associated with their capability of, of breeding. Um, shrinking during the summer for their time to be into Colorado and to successfully raise a brood that has time to uh, fully develop as fledglings and as young flighted birds sufficiently before they themselves need to start migrating in the fall as well. Well, um, looking forward, um, these aspects associated with connectivity, um, I'm only scratching the surface of and, and uh, it warrants a lot more attention to be, able to be looking at these aspects associated with migration. So students and I will just need to, you know, uh, <laughs> keep attaching these devices for the years to come to try to increase our capability of, of learning the breadth of the areas that these owls migrate to and stop over. And as well, look at, uh, and this is happening right now, um, working with colleagues across uh, different locations in the West to see whether or not areas in New Mexico, from New Mexico out to the West Coast and up to British Columbia, the owl, the flammulated owls that are nesting there, um, how their migration routes compare to this, whether there is, um, uh, they share in common stopover sites, uh, wintering sites remains to be seen, but uh, some early data suggests that they probably have some different routes that, that extend um, more westerly down to the wintering destinations that that uh, are in Mexico as well. And finally, the last thing that I wanna to return to is looking more closely um, in Mexico and Central America about habitat partition, partitioning and how it may be that the migrants and the resident flying millet owls are, are able to share the same habitat and, and uh, um, you know, have this degree of, of overlap in, in their sharing that enables them to coexist. And with that, I spoke to this slide in general, but um, I think I'm going to go right to the question aspects. I'd like to acknowledge um, a lot of students over time that have been part of this work. Colorado College, the Rocky Research Station, Fish and Wildlife Service, all of these individuals have, have been key figures in, in funding that have supported the research project. Um, finally, my colleague at the University of Michoacan that's made all of the work in Mexico possible and likely will be going forward, uh, Dr. Javier Salgado-Ortiz has been central to the efforts down there. So with that, I'll be happy to entertain questions. That was excellent. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I think everyone enjoyed that, enjoyed that very much. Mm -hmm. And everyone um, was probably but, hooting uh, during. Uh, the, we yes, the well, lots of. Well, yeah, that's right. It's it's time for the for the post presentation quiz. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Starting oh, with sure. my hosts. Oh, <laughs> oh okay. <laughs> well, actually, Mark <laughs> is a very good hooter. Oh, I, I'm, I'm, uh, you're gonna make me hoot now. Yes. <laughs> if you came up with a hoot and nanny joke, I think you're required. Oh, no, that's just bad. Yeah. No, I, I, I'm going to start doing a, I'm going to start doing saw wet instead of a. <laughs> instead of a yeah. Well, I um, think while we're waiting for questions to come in, I had a couple of things. One of the uh, pictures you showed us of an owl inside the cavity, it looks like it was kind of excavated, uh, not excavated, but kind of redecorated by the owl a little bit. Do they kind of redecorate when they get to the, uh, to their nesting cavities? Yeah, are you, are you talking about the lining of the cavity? 
Yeah, well, no, it looked like they had. I... The entrance? Yeah, the entrance. Oh, okay. Um, well, the answer is no on both ends, actually. Um, the uh, Some of the caveats, it, it's, it's possible that, um, I can't remember without looking at the, at the photo again. Yeah. Uh, I often have to um, use a hand saw when I climb the trees, hand saw to enlarge the entrance slightly so that my fat hand and fat arm can reach down uh -huh. to the cavity to retrieve retrieve the owlets. Uh, but um, actually, I've seen over the years that this doesn't deter the owls. The, one of the primary aspects that's important to them is cavity depth. It needs to be large enough for them to be able, be able to get in the cavity, and cavity depth is important. But they'll be happy to reuse cavities that, that uh, Linkhart has modified the entrance of. Um, but in terms of the bottom of the cavity, uh, you know, there's, there's no de redecoration there as well, in case anybody might be wondering. They'll just use the, uh, the wood duff that's in the bottom of the cavity. If there happen to be some, some sticks or nest material that's left over from the previous occupant, they'll typically remove those. Interesting, interesting. And I noticed on the uh, Guatemala owl, uh, the one that you tracked by GPS, it looked like it passed over some water. And I thought owls and um, ah. I, I avoid that. Thanks for bringing that up. No, that is just the... The shortest distance between two points is a straight line that happened to go over water. <laughs> so that is to say, um, you know, so you can program these GPS devices, luckily so, to identify particular days that you want the GPS to turn on and to communicate with the satellites. And um, unfortunately, on this side of it, I did not have inter any intervening points between where it was last um, recorded in Mexico. And then when it ended up in in Guatemala, so I don't I don't know where those inter, intertwining points were. Um, you know, my GPS and my GIS software just connected those those points. Yeah, we're kind of used to the breadcrumb kind of tracking of GPS. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 Well, so if, if you've you got, got battery, got large yeah. devices that are powered by you know real time um, battery or solar or whatever, then you can get, <laughs> you don't. Yeah. Have to, yeah. And the last question I had, um, you uh, use undergrad students to do a lot of the field work, and, you know, at night in a very dark forest. So my question is, how many undergrads do you generally lose per summer? <laughs> Sometimes I wonder if I've got more undergraduate students than I do owls. <laughs> um, especially on quiet nights when, you know, occupants of territories are just totally silent, even though you know they're there. But yeah. Uh, yeah, we um, we lose people at least for short periods of time, especially early in the summer when they're getting their bearings. But uh, <laughs> we're always in communication with each other, so it's it's never been serious situations. All right. Well, we have lots of questions that lots have come in. Mark, you want to sure. Okay. Um, so John asks: Are the residents' vocalizations the same as the migratory birds? Yeah, great question to ask, and absolutely so. Appears to be no difference in any of the characteristics that I know that I can tell so far, except for the physical characteristics that I mentioned. Hmm. Interesting. Um, yeah, so I can go down to Mexico and and use Colorado flam hoots to <laughs> uh, call up Mexico owls down there as well. And, you know, mm -hmm. they're probably looking at me and saying, well, Dude, you don't have the right dialect, but <laughs> <laughs> but even even on sonograms, you can't tell any difference. No, it can't. Yeah, interesting. They're just very very similar to each other. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, James asks, um, why would it take more than twice as long to migrate north than to go south? Once one starts a migration north, I'd expect an owl to rush to set up its territory. Yeah, um, that's an interesting question. And um, uh, I have to preface this by saying, um, you know, all of the early geolocator returns that I had uh, supported the, the, the idea that uh, the, the return north migration was much slower than the, than the southern migration was. Um, I've had a number of, of males since then where it's been more or less pretty similar between them. But um, I think at least for those birds where that is the case, where there's such a beeline to get down to Mexico and then a slow migration coming back in the spring, um, 
it is very different from a number of songbirds and, and what's what's known about the migration routes of, of other songbirds, where, um, you know, from a natural selection standpoint, it makes sense to get back to those summer territories as quickly as you can and, and establish your, your, your presence to defend the space as well as be there in time to attract a female as well. I think the difficulty with that from the standpoint of, of a flymillator owl, the study sites that I was referring to here in Colorado, they're on the order of about uh, 8,500 to 9,000 feet. And, um, you know, typically, certainly historically, that's been changing. The, the nighttime temperatures are below freezing and they return to Colorado in May. And it has meant that I, I think the stakes are, are much higher for returning to Colorado too soon when those spring snow, snowstorms and wet fronts can really pose a survival danger to owls, especially if they may be, may be re returning to the breeding ground with very little fat reserves as well. So they have to take longer, I think, especially by stopping over at these staging areas like I was talking about in New, New, northern New Mexico for a longer period of time. Mm -hmm. With several of the, of the geolocators where I can get such uh, repetitive on consecutive days in terms of their locations and so forth, that northern New Mexico, strangely enough, for, for those males has, has shown that they have spent the most time on that stopover site compared to any other stopover for their entire migration. And that's only 300 kilometers away from the breeding site. Hmm. I think that's pretty telling. Yeah, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, Lance asks, what about the timing of southbound migration for adults versus hatchier birds? Uh, good question. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, that is to say, uh, these devices, you know, the reason they work, these work pretty well on flammulated owls is because they have really high fidelity. The males have really high fidelity there. They, um, I didn't mention this earlier, but they are likely to spend their entire lifetimes on the same territory, the breeding territory in Colorado. Um, and um, so the chances are pretty good that I'll have an opportunity to recapture a male once he's returned with a device on its back in a subsequent year. The owlets, unfortunately, almost never return to the study area to breed. That is to say, they are not returning to their natal site. And that's all about, uh, highly likely anyway, inbreeding avoidance to yeah. avoid the opportunity to possibly mate with mom or dad. And so uh, that's another way of saying, if I put, uh, which I have not done, if I put a geolocator or a GPS device on the owlets, um, I would just never see it again. I would never see that owlet again. I would never have an opportunity to recapture. So I'm waiting for the day for those individuals to be represented by migration data as well, for sure. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's a difficult problem there. Um, uh, it's, it's sort of intractable until technology gets better. Right. Um, so Pete asks, do pairs stay together year to year? Great question to ask. And the short answer is about 50% of the time they do. Actually, I should say it's closer to about 60%. Um, the other part of that answer is, <clears throat> I just got through telling you that males show extremely high fidelity to their breeding territories. Females, not so much. <laughs> yeah. Are really prone to divorce. Um, so much so that they are only likely to return to their previous male um, partner about 60% of the time. Hmm. So the length of um, a pair bond really rests on the shoulders of the female and whether she chooses to return to her previous uh, male and territory or not. And do the males and females migrate south together anywhere? Uh, so I have not all, I've, I've also not placed um, de devices on uh, females up until this, this period of time because uh, it appears females have a shorter lifespan than males. And I have wanted to try to minimize the weight on um, all the birds for sure. And I've been reluctant to put extra weight on the females for fear that I might even 
uh, cause, uh, you know, contribute to a lower mortality rate on their part as well. So in short, I, very, I know very little about uh, migration of females. Um, and so that's another way of saying the males are the only ones I really have starting to get a handle on, on migration data at this time. Nothing mm -hmm. with respect to the owlets or the females. Okay. Um... Thank you. Uh, the next question by Lily. Over your decades of research, have you noticed any population declines or increases? Uh, the short answer to that is no. Um, and the problem is, is be, well, what I can tell you is on my study sites, the populations have remained remarkably stable over time. But unfortunately, that doesn't tell you very much mm. because um, these are pretty especially the sites where um, I've studied the longest. I established sites in these older forests of Ponderosapine because I, I wondered if that might be their best breeding habitat. And it, it appears that, by the way, that it, that is the case. So the problem with that is these may very well serve as the best areas to breed um, compared to other areas. And it may mean that uh, populations around surrounding areas that may not be in as good a habitat, maybe, um, you know, losing birds um, uh, and nobody would detect them, while birds in the best breeding sites, perhaps where my study sites are, um, are, you know, remaining relatively uh, uh, flat in terms of change from year to year, but that's simply be maybe the most attractive habitat for any owl to come into. So we really need, um, if I had time, it what would really need to happen is to broaden the study area hugely to be able to track individuals um, over long periods of time to be able to see if the entire populations over large scales are decreasing rather than on relatively small areas like my study sites. Mm -hmm. um, ben asks, he says, great talk which I agree with. Um, curious if there have been any genetic work done on migratory versus the resident populations. Not yet is the short answer, but I'm on the cusp of that right now. I've got um, several genetic studies that are um, uh, underway. Um, we've been sexing the, the owlets based on their blood DNA for a number of years because you, know, you can't tell them apart. You also can't tell, tell adults from each other males and females either. Um, so the only way we're able to to <laughs> sex uh, adults is by their their different behaviors, their different vocalizations. So we, we have done uh, blood-based DNA tests for some years. Um, currently, um, I'm uh, waiting on data regarding parentage based on genetic analyses. And the next step in this is also going to be um, attempting to uh, take blood samples or feathers and or feather samples from populations in Mexico, resident birds, as well as here in Colorado, and more definitively determine some of the characteristics associated with, with the, uh, the genome in those populations as well. So that'll be an interesting aspect going forward too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Lance asks, what are the longest single night migration flights that have been documented? that is without stopping? Among flammulated owls, um, I'd have to say it, um, let's see, that would have to be based on my uh, geolocator data with, in which I can get consecutive days. Um, generally about uh, five to 600 miles um, in one 24 hour period, hmm. which is a pretty long flight for forest yes. owl. Just a little owl. Yeah, <laughs> for, for a little owl. Um, so uh, there's a question from the live stream from uh, uh, from Frank. Have you observed adults roosting during the day, and will adults use non-nest cavities as roost sites? Great question to ask, and all I can really answer that by is is breeding during the breeding season. And I can tell you that during the breeding season. Females are the only ones that'll use, use the nest cavity and that's for nesting. Um, so that's the only function of the cavity basically is for nesting. 
Males will roost out in the open during the breeding season. They will typically roost in about a hundred meter radius of the nest against the trunk of a large ponderosa pine um, where they just become invisible. And um, so that's the lifestyle of a male is, you know, uh, 24, he's, he's out in the open um, and relying on his camouflage during his, on his daytime roosts to um, de deter predators. And, and it works very well from, <laughs> from the lack of predation events that, that I've seen over the length of the study. Hmm. So they don't use cavities um, during the breeding season, except for, for, for nesting. And the females will roost in the cavity, um, you know, during the duration of the nesting season, except towards about the last week of the nestling period, when it, the nest cavity, when, when the young no longer need her body heat to stay warm, and then she'll roost out in the open forest like the male will as well. Okay. And, and how about down uh, in Mexico? Wow, I wish I could tell you that. Okay. I don't know that. Yeah, <laughs> that's going to require some in intensive radio telemetry work in Mexico, which has not been done. Okay. Um, Melanie asks, uh, in the photo in the upper left, is that an ambassador of flammulated owl or one just captured? It appears very friendly. <laughs> that is actually an owlet that had just fledged and um, Eric had, had rushed over to be able to take quick measurements on him before we released him and got out of his way. But yeah, that's an owl that had, that had just left the nest for good. <laughs> mm -hmm. And by the way, owlets are, are about 24 days old when, when they leave the nest. So that was that on the night of that owlet's maiden flight. Great. Um, Lance asks, oh, have you tried, or what about, has anybody tried using modus tags? Um, not yet. That's, you know, once we can get uh, uh, prepared, I think, for having, you know, stations that are set up for enabling us to be able to, to, to be able to employ such data, that would be wonderful to be able to take advantage of, but not yet. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, Patricia asks, uh, you mentioned that the, the owls are in uh, monarch butterfly sites. Do they predate the butterflies? Well, no, um, at least there's no evidence of that yet. Um, so the, the net that actually accidentally captured a flammulated owl in 2009, <laughs> they were actually after, it, it, it was definitely an attempt by the researchers to determine what songbirds were potentially preying on the uh, you know the monarchs on their roosts, and so they had these mess, mist nets that were set up around the forest and so forth, and they must have been super slow on breaking down at least one of the nets that night, <laughs> and it stayed up um, you know at dusk anyway, and they accidentally ca captured a flam in it. So um, I don't I don't think flams and and based on the capturing efforts that I've engaged in um, around uh, the Sierra Cinque Preserve and so forth. I haven't actually uh, captured any owls in the mist nets that I've set up adjacent to the wintering area or the the overwintering sites by the monarchs, and I think most mm. because you know these monarchs are primarily going um, opting for high higher elevation forests to roost in than flammulated owls are occupying. Mm. Oh yeah, forests, and so it's the forest habitat up. It's sort of like the equivalent of the spruce for fir forests that we have in Western North America that are, that are higher elevation than the ponderosa pine. No. Oh, okay. Um, another question. Um, are there predators for these, for flammulated owls like other owls? Oh, yes. Um, man, you name it, anything that's um, a predator in either the skin of a mammal or skin of a, of a hawk or owl, they'll be happy to take flams. Um, it's just that it doesn't happen very often to the adults. It's it's really unusual for me to be able to do, for me to have documented over the last forty years an adult that's been killed during the breeding season on the study area. Um, in fact, that's only happened with. Uh, so I've students and I have banded um, over about twenty uh, over two thousand owls. Oh, wow. 
<laughs> since the beginning of the study, you know, a little more than half of those are owlets. But that's still about a thousand uh, adult fly mulated owls. And of those, I've only been able to document two, fe two females that were preyed upon during the breeding season. Mm. Um, one probably by um, a great horned owl. It could, have, it could have been an occipiter hawk. I'm not quite sure, but I think it was a great horned owl. And the other one, uh, actually, it just died. I, I, I must have been in poor health. I, it, was, it was not preyed upon. Um, so I don't know what the story was with it. But owlets, it's a totally different story. <laughs> Unfortunately, life is rough for, you know, any, any young bird. And uh, in the weeks after young leave the nest, I, um, I think there's probably, I'm estimating on the order of about um, 50 to 60% of the owlets um, uh, perish in the first month after fledging. And this is especially due to occipiter hawks. Sharp chinned hawks, Cooper's hawk, um, occasionally goshawks, but even mammals. I actually retrieved uh, the harness that I had on a fledgling flammulated owl that I found in um, the uh, in in the um, in the burrow of a mountain lion that had taken up residence underneath a, a boulder field. So don't know if the mountain lion got it or not, or if just <laughs> somehow, you know, somehow it got, the, the harness at least got, got carried underneath, but um, coyotes um, and um, uh, some other small mammal predators, I think are, are probably capable of taking flymulated owls down as well. And this is primarily, primarily during the period of time in which young flymulated owls are not flying very strongly yet. And so, Sometimes during the day, they will roost relatively close to the ground where they're vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. But adults, man, the, the cam they work their camouflage and they have, have very high survival rates as a result. Um, John asked, are there studies done in burnt areas to show how long it takes for flams to return after fires? Um, yeah, this is this is important for us because we've just had a, a series of fires, um, one and large one very recently. Yeah, um, in in flammulated habitat. Yeah, that's a that's a great question to ask, and the answer to that is yes. Uh, one of my study sites um, is um, associated with an area that's that's referred to as the Hayman Fire, the Hayman Burn, which um, it, until about four years ago was the largest wildfire in Colorado's history. That's only about uh, oh, a short distance away from a couple of my study sites, uh, other study sites. Anyway, I established a study site in the Hayman Burn area as soon as it happened in 2002. And we have been um, studying the owls that uh, uh, have returned to breed in that area um, ever since. And there've been some interesting patterns that have resulted over time. The fact that, you know, flammulated owl is a forest owl is probably not too much of a surprise to suspect that flammulated owls have not taken up residence in areas that uh, burned with high intensity. That is to say, very few surviving trees uh, occupy these particular sites. Um, what flammulated owls have taken advantage of on occasion are the smaller islands of surviving trees that... Um, maybe on the order of a, a few acres large, uh, just large enough to contain a flammulated owl territory that burned at low, severe, uh, uh, low intensity, where most of the trees have survived, where the fire you know, um, was not um, uh, crowning, it had come down to the ground and was thinning out as most historical fires did. Um, and those are the types of uh, burn areas that owls have returned to, but they're mostly stands of surviving trees. Um, however, that said, um, the data that I've had from this Hayman burn area have suggested that overall, this is not a very desirable place to breed. Uh, these owls, uh, um, you know, since I track individuals over their entire lifetimes, I'm able to see, for example, uh, how long particular males will occupy territories, how long their, their survival, uh, what, what their longevity is, on their territories and so forth. 
And um, the pattern in the Hayman burn area for males that have gone there to breed is that their, their rates of fidelity are lower and their tenure on territories is shorter than they are in unburned forests. Um, they're able to successfully breed okay when they do, but um, my current thinking is that there's a price to be paid for trying to breed in the Hayman burn, and they may be uh, sacrificing a lot of energy to find the food and support the family that they do. Because they're, I, something I didn't mention, they, they transport their, their prey, their moths, one, one insect at a time back to the nest, just right. like a, a true raptor, like a, <laughs> you know, pick your raptor and they will carry one mouse, one, one bird, one small mammal back to the nest at a time. And flams will do that with a small insect, which is interesting. So there's a strong, um, a, a strong cost of energetics involved in the foraging strategy of flammulated owls. And my current thinking is that foraging in places like the Hayman burn is not very productive for them in the long run. They can make it through a breeding season, but perhaps it may be at the cost of longer term, turn, a longer term occupancy of such habitats as a breeder. Mm. Lance asked, what are the lowest heights of nests above ground that you found? Lowest nets, nest that we found um, has been about uh, two meters high, um, about six feet. Mm -hmm. oh. um, and the highest one in Colorado, this is reflected at the, the fact that forests are not nearly as high here as, say, the West, you know, coastal mountains or, or forests on the West Coast or even the Sierras, um, about 70 feet high with the average probably being about, um, oh, let's see, about 15 meters or so, about uh, 40 to 35 to 40 feet would probably be about the average. Oh, okay. Yeah. And always in mature trees? Or? They will nest in um, snags, standing dead trees, as well as live trees. Mm -hmm. so he has cavities in them, they'll they'll consider them whether they're oh, great. Thank you. Uh, James asked, is the eye shine color unique to flams? Um, you know, um, at least in terms of um, eye shine compared to other species of owls, um, it'd be similar to what you might find in, say, a spotted owl, other dark eyed owls. Um, or or barred owl, um, it would it would be a little different than it would be with those with you know that have that have uh, yellow eyes um, more than uh, even something like the saw wet say or the northern pygmy, but um, for other dark eyed owls it's it's pretty similar. Mm -hmm. um, John asks. Um... Do flams return to the same cavities year after year, not just the same territories? Great question to ask. And the short answer on that is usually not. Mm. Uh, so they will nest in the same territory. I did say that. But uh, the reason we have to mark all of the, you know, keep track of an inventory of all of the cavities in a territory is that they, they will typically change trees from one year to the next. Um, and they may be on opposite sides of the territory. Um, on occasion, you do see consecutive years in the same cavity. And usually that happens when there are relatively few alternatives in terms of good cavity selection within a particular territory, but not all that often. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Chris asks, do males and females duet like great horns do? No, they don't. Uh, the males are the only ones that will give the territorial call, flams, that is. Mm -hmm. Females, um, so I, I probably won't try to imitate female <laughs> calls very well. Oh, please well. do. Oh, come on. <laughs> it's just so bad. Uh, so if the, the most common vocalization that a female will give is her food solicitation call, okay? And it sounds... All right, so here's here's the bad imitation. It sounds a little bit like a like a, a cat or a kitten mewing. Okay. 
it's a it's a relatively high pitched sound that I can't <laughs> can't do very well, and it's very quiet. You typically have to be within, um, oh man, uh, usually within twenty feet or so to be able to hear it very well. Wow! Mm -hmm. If you're a first time visitor that comes out at night with us to to go into the forest, you may not hear it all until you just get right up next close to the bird or underneath the tree of the, of of the female. Mm -hmm. So all the vocalizations of flams are are pretty quiet, but decidedly quiet among females. Mm -hmm. No, they will not give a territorial call. Interesting, interesting. Well, fantastic. And going back to the Oreo question, you did not indicate if you're talking regular Oreo or double stuff. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I was not very specific, was I? <laughs> a regular Oreo is only about 11.3 grams. Okay, thanks for correcting me. So <laughs> regular Oreo is what I was referring to. If you're wondering, double stuff is about 14 and a half. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so for 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 the the single Oreo cookie, then that's about equivalent to probably about um, you know nine ish GPS or or, or geolocator units. <laughs> oh, that's that's something. Well, thank you very much. It's really been an informative uh, webinar and lots of interest, lots of questions. Yeah, so we appreciate your time and effort. And yeah, thank you so much. Research. This is. A this is so fantastic. You're quite welcome. Uh, Happy to do so, and I appreciate the invite. Absolutely. And let me put my thanks in as well. And Mine for too. anyone uh, with us still, please join us next month for um, for Gulls. And with that, uh, I good night, everyone. Thank you very much. And thank you again, Brian. We really appreciate it. Yep, thank you. You so bet, Ron. Much. Ron, good Mark. Night. Nice to have met you. Take care. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night. See you.